the fund when I said, you know, Donald, it's it's running down. He comes back with your son doesn't recognize you. Let him die and move down to Florida. And again, you know, it's hard to explain that in any rational way, how somebody could say that. I mean, imagine hearing that from from William's great uncle. My guest today is Fred Trump, the son of the late Fred Trump Jr. and nephew of the disgraced former president. His brand new memoir, All in the Family, The Trumps and How We Got This Way, was released on Tuesday. Hey, Fred, I I believe you're the first Trump to grace the Never Trump Bulwark podcast. Uh, So welcome to the lion's den. How are you doing? Thanks. I don't feel like it's the lion's den. I feel welcome. (laughs) Okay, good, good, good. Well, I have to start, though, by asking, I mean, my burning question about all this has just got to be, why now? You've written this book. I think you're aware that your uncle ran for president twice already. Um, so there were plenty of opportunities to to speak out about his about his behavior and about your family. Just wondering why you decided to do it in this moment. Well, there are a few reasons. Number one, we actually didn't just start now uh, or or think about this book. Um, and we've been advocating on behalf of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities for years. When Donald was uh, inaugurated just a few months later, uh, my wife Lisa and I uh, spent time down in Washington with various uh, cabinet members, uh, secretaries, and uh, uh, an organization we've been involved with for a long time. To to answer your question more directly, it really was we were waiting for William, who is now 25, to be settled in a group home. Uh, we didn't want to get involved in in writing a book because uh, we knew what the repercussions would be. So that, that's really the reason why we waited. Sure. You know, um, you could have done some interviews or something, though. You know, I could have uh, could have leaked this. You could have leaked some of the good, juicy stuff to me. I don't know. I mean, you did. I guess for 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 listeners who haven't read the book, you did. You said you did vote for both Hillary and Biden, um, okay. and so you know had, had opposed your uncle in both campaigns. But you know, there were opportunities to speak out, right? Yes, there were. And uh, you know, I personally, I have. I didn't feel like uh, at that point. It was uh, the right time to get fully involved in the public in doing so. Yeah. But now is the time. And as, as you may know, I have uh, not just said I will be voting for Kamala Harris, but I will uh, I will be campaigning for her if asked, because I believe her policies are conducive to what I think is important for the future of this country. Okay. Well, um in that case, what I want to do, I, I do want to talk about your your son William. You have three children. Uh, William is the youngest, um, as you mentioned, um, right. was, was dealing with with medical issues and, and disabilities. I, I want to kind of talk about him and the relationship with Donald and and all the drama surrounding that. But if, if you don't mind, I, I want to go back to childhood first. Can we start at Can we start at childhood? Because- My childhood. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, or maybe your father, or maybe your father and uncle's childhood as well. Let's even go further than your childhood back. Um, uh, your father, for people who don't know, Fred Trump Jr. Um, died after a bout with alcoholism when you were you were young, you were in your teens. Um, and uh, I just, I don't know. I feel like this one of the skeleton keys to the former president, your uncle, um, it, both in kind of why he's so dangerous, but also, you know, maybe why he's not as dangerous as some people imagine um, in, in certain ways is just uh, is kind of the the lack of love from your grandfather in the family, the daddy issues, maybe the the lack of empathy in the in the home. And I just kind of wonder, that's just me armchair psychologizing from New Orleans. So you lived it all in Queens. I'm wondering how you what you think about all that. Well, yeah, I'm not uh, I guess you'd call me an armchair psychologist, too. Uh Sure. Our childhood was was interesting. Yes, we we lived in a very uh, family that was dominated at the time by my grandfather. Um, not not a very loving environment. Uh, to give you an insight, as best I can tell, and again, I'm I'm one of the only people that was there during Donald's formative years, and kept the relationship, you know, through my childhood, uh, during his business career, during his uh, his political run. So I know Donald. Back in those days, 
my father was expected to become the heir apparent to my grandfather. My dad didn't want anything to do with that. He, he didn't. He had a passion for flying and he wanted to be an airline pilot. And he did. Uh, and during that time, he was basically belittled by my grandfather and, and by Donald. And the interesting part about that is my dad, Donald's older brother, gave Donald a, a pathway to be the heir apparent. Dad didn't want right. anything to do with it. Knowing that, Donald still beat him down. And uh, that's, that's tragic. So the, the cruelty does exist in the family. And you're seeing that through Donald's uh, political career. And I guess my other side of that coin always is like, Donald, while he is, he's not very empathetic, it would be the understatement of the year. I'm, I'm reading some of your stories about you know, how he would uh, storm off if you know your dad threw mashed potatoes at him, things, right. things like this. He also like deeply wants to be loved, right? I, like, he wants the attention. He wants the adulation. And, and I do think in some ways maybe that's, that's he doesn't want to be hated, Right. And I, and I think that's an important thing to understanding him, even though, you know, maybe his actions don't always lead to that. You know, I was I w as you were speaking, I was going to use the word adulation. Yeah. And I, I was speaking to someone today and what's happening now with Kamala Harris in the spotlight. It yeah. drives him crazy. Yes. Absolutely drives him crazy. I mean, he he didn't coin the phrase, but any press is good press. Yeah. And he's lived that uh, for as long as I've known him. And that's a long time. Yeah, it's interesting. So you said that you knew him when, uh, during the formative years. So you're, since you're, his, your dad was older. So yes. you guys are only like, what, 18 years apart or something like that? About, 17, yeah. Yeah, 16 years apart. One of the interesting yeah. little anecdotes I got from the book that I don't, maybe people have talked about this. Unfortunately, I know way more about your uncle than I wish I did. I, I wish I could kind of <laughs> take he's a lot of that. Family. Yeah. I wish I could use that part of my brain to like learn a language or do something useful. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I know a lot about him. One thing that I surprised me about your book was, uh, was you were talking about during your childhood when you'd go back to your grandfather's house and Donald and his late brother Robert were still living there. And I was like doing the math and I'm like, he was in his mid twenties. He was like living at home still like after college, after. Well, he after for a short while, but then he, he did yeah. move into the city after a while. But remember he, back in those days, he was working in uh, my grandfather's company in Brooklyn. So right. to, to live in Queens made it considerably more easy. And, and many times, many times uh, I witnessed they would drive together. So into work, into work in, in Brooklyn. Yeah. yeah. It just does speak. I mean, you know, I understand how that makes maybe makes sense and makes convenience, but it speaks to the nepotism like element of it, even a little, even a little more, more significantly. When it was like yeah. after college, he goes into the family business. He lives at home. He's commuting with his father into the office, right. Right. and it's it's uh, it was something that I guess I just didn't really I didn't think a lot about Donald in his twenties, I guess, but um, yeah. it, it was something that 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 stood out. Um, and, and so you know you're. Dad, then t talk about kind of the the initial sort of falling out. You get older, you go you go off to school. You know, your dad is struggling with alcoholism, and, and what was kind of happening in the family? Well, unfortunately, Dad's last number of years, and and even beyond, he he was sick much of his adult life. You know, thirties on, but in in the last five years of his life, he he was in and out of hospital um, a lot, and he mm -hmm. died pretty much alone. It, it, I don't know. I mean, you've read the book, you know, the scene yeah. when he basically is taken to Queens hospital alone in an ambulance that, that unfortunately sums up uh, the story of his end and how my family treated him even in his, his near demise and his demise. Uh, oh. Very, very sad. Yeah. And then, and then it's not long after that, that, um, you know, kind of the seeds of the, you know, big conflict between you and your sister Mary, you know, with the family um, happens when, when I guess Donald's having financial trouble. I like that you call him Donald. Donald's having financial trouble um, uh, in the, in the eighties. And that, and that is when, you know, he comes up with this idea to restructure his father's, your grandfather's will to right. cut you guys out. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a tough story. And as you know, uh, Donald was my trustee during those times. After my father passed away, Donald was my trustee, which I take to mean he is there to protect me. And when William was born a day after or so, he started having seizures, hundreds of seizures a day. All the while, this plan had been hashed and was ready to be implemented. And sure enough, a couple of weeks after William got home, we got the notice that we were out. Uh, and I wasn't going to let that happen. And certainly Mary wasn't. If, if there's one thing Mary is, is she is tenacious and she's going to fight. Uh, and she, she fought as hard as I did, if not more. We were, we were very vulnerable, Lisa and I, at that point, as you can imagine. So you have a late father, you have a young family, your youngest child is in the hospital having seizures, having health problems, and you get a letter from Donald's lawyer that says, you're out. Yeah. You're out of, you're out of will. And then it is not long after that, that there's, you know, some back and forth on this. And as a power play, they, they take away the health insurance. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's insane. Like, did, did you ever, did you ever call during that period? I mean, he's your trustee. He's your uncle. Your child is in the hospital with, with a scary illness. Yeah. We didn't know if William was going to live or die. And that's, again, that is, that's just a cold, hard, horrible fact. We, every time uh, he was in the neonatal intensive care unit at Sinai for three weeks now, all my aunts and uncles live within a half a mile radius of Mount Sinai. None of them, none of them came to visit. In fact, one night I remember my grandmother, and we tried to keep this hidden from her, but once we realized the extent, we had to let her know. And she said uh, a couple of weeks in, I have a relative from Scotland, and why don't you go out to dinner with them and just try to relax and have a, a nice night? So Lisa and I go into a restaurant to meet these folks, and who's sitting there? Donald and Melania. And we're probably 15 feet away from them walking to our table. And he shouts out, hey, I hear your kid is sick. And that was it. None of my aunts or uncles had ever met William, ever. Hmm. And how long, how, how long, how long after that uh, he was born was that encounter? Uh, that was probably about two weeks or so. Because we, again, we were at yeah. Sinai for three weeks. So somewhere between yeah. two to three weeks. Sure. And then the months after, like when was I, I, I so now you're kind of embroiled in this legal battle or you guys right. are challenging the, the will that he cut you out of because he was going bankrupt and, yes. um, and they and they cut off the health insurance for your youngest child. And then he, he met the child when like year, what year, year, like a year later, two years later, five, About a year never. Later. Yeah. After, after we settled and, uh, you know, I, I have to say this, we settled, uh, for the guy who says he never settles, well, maybe then I'm I'm the champ here, and and, and Mary, and I, I have to give credit to Mary. She she uh, she realized our situation, and she wanted to go further. So I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, but yeah. It you was didn't get like a you didn't get a cookie bouquet. You didn't get you know, and he has Absolutely. assistance at this point. He's on his third wife, so he's got assistance. He's got money. You didn't get you know. You didn't send send something Absolutely over to nothing. the hospital. We, did, we just got a lot of legal notices, uh, Tim. That's that's uh, that's pretty shitty. And then in the book, uh, to, to to be an understatement, and in the book it seems like you don't really even reconnect with him until around a golf. Then yeah, yeah, about a year after we we settled, uh, I Donald had invited me to become a member at the the club in Westchester, yeah. and I said the only way I'll do that is if we play a round of golf together, which he he accepted. We played a round of golf. It, it was nice. I, I always had a, a, a good relationship with Donald. I just, I do want to say that it, it was, he's done sure. horrible, horrible things to me. Um, but I wanted to, to see this. And at the end of the match, we got together, just the two of us. And he said, we're done. Right. And I knew exactly when he meant it. it wasn't, we're done. No more relationship. It was, we're done with the animosity. Right. And I said, yes. And he actually hugged me which, uh, oh. well, you know, that, that, that's cool. I mean, he, he would hug me when I was four or five years old, but this, this was, I mean, it was, it was genuine. It, it, it was. 
he probably could have used a few more hugs. It seems like that might, <laughs> that might have saved us some problems down the line. Um, You're going back so, to the armchair psychologist. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so okay. So he hugs you, and then uh, he comes to visit William, or you have, uh, you know, I, I guess I, the family does do a, you know, kind of a medical fund at some point once right. once all that is resolved. But um, you have an, you you write about an exchange where you talk about how it was a gene issue. Um, right. uh, the, the, the disability was, was genetic and, and, and Donald, what is, how does Donald react to that? Uh, he said almost immediately, my wife, uh, we had gone up to see Donald in his office and my wife, Lisa mentioned that, uh, that he had a KCNQ2 genetic mutation. He goes, not, not from our genes, not, not the Trump genes. We're, we're, we're that. Yeah. And, and honestly that Tim, if you don't mind, let me just go back real please. quick about that. Slide. Yeah, no, please. That fund is to help with Met, uh, Williams' medical expenses, all therapeutic, which insurance doesn't cover, necessary for him to have the healthiest life possible. Yeah. That fund wouldn't have been necessary. I wouldn't have had to go to my aunts and uncles each year or so to ask for yeah. it to be replenished yeah. if that lawsuit didn't come. If, if they hadn't screwed around with my rightful inheritance, I would have taken the money that was due me from my grandfather's will, and I would have done what I would have done with it to make sure. So I just want to make sure people yeah. understand that. That's a fair you point. Know, and it, on the it, other hand, Fred, you just got to think about it from Donald's perspective. I mean, that money had other uses. He had to pay off the various yeah. women he was having affairs with, you know, uh, there are other, th- other maybe more higher and better purposes of that money than your son's medical care. Do you ever consider that? Uh, he was in deep financial straits, uh, mm. to not to minimize it. He was, he was on the balls of his ass at that time. Oh God. Did he ever sell his penthouse apartment or, you know, stop riding in limos or pl- get rid of the plane or anything? Did he ever, well, ever, ever he, suffer any consequences, personal consequences, stop going to fancy dinners? No. I mean, the, the banks did put him on uh, a leash back then, mm. which must have been pretty humiliating to him. Sort of a, an allowance, if you will. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to William. So not our genes. Um, and you move forward. And I just I just do want to put a finer point on that. So then, I want to go fast forward to then when he becomes president and kind of how and yeah. conversation around around William and your advocacy then. But in that intervening period. He's a reality show host. You know, he's got time. Uh, was he checking in, you know, coming to visit his nephew, um, no. offering any care, uh, trying to make his life any better, more comfortable, anything like that? Besides the the money in the fund, which, again, was, was rightfully mine, there was no visits or checking mm-hmm. in about William at all. Woof. Um Okay. So then he gets elected. Uh, as I mentioned, you said you'd voted for Hillary, um, yes, but sir. you do go down um, a couple times. Once, I believe, for your aunt's birthday party yes. held in the White House, and then another time to advocate for... Um, uh, well, actually, why don't, you just, why don't you just talk about the advocacy meeting um, that well, you held the, in the, 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 the quick was, yes, the that birthday was for uh, Marianne's 80th and Elizabeth's 75th. So Donald offered to host it down in Washington, uh, and it was, it was a nice evening. The next morning, Lisa and I and the group that we were, we were helping uh, had a meeting with Ben Carson, uh, um, and that went well. And, and, and I, I do want to say Ivanka- well, so He was the Secretary of, of Housing at the time. Was it about, right. was it about housing? housing? Urban Development, yeah. Well, housing is a major issue with yeah. uh, the complex disability uh, community. So we figured that was a good start. And Ivanka was great in setting that up, my cousin Ivanka. Mm-hmm. And we did, throughout the years he was in office, met with Alex Azar uh, and, and various other uh, parts of, uh, of the uh, executive uh, branch. Uh, and, and, and it was great, culminating. The administration, yeah. Yeah, in the administration, I'm sorry. Culminating uh, in an, a meeting, first of all, in the cabinet uh, room, with Azar and Brett Giroir, who you'll remember from COVID, uh, who he was on mm-hmm. on the screen every day, and a few other governmental officials and and me. And I remember saying, listen, folks, I'm the least important person in this meeting. Here are the, the folks that have been doing this and they're geniuses. And it ended positively. And then we were 
ushered into Donald's office, the Oval Office, and uh, we had a good 45-minute uh, conversation. And uh, we, we all dispersed. I was called back in a minute later. Donald greets me with his usual, hey, pal, how's it going? And we, we spoke for a couple of seconds. And he goes, you know, those people, those expenses, they should just die. Uh, it's a pretty rough thing to, to wrap your head around when you hear that. Yeah, it's reminiscent kind of of the suckers and losers comment you know there's like there's really a through line that to the to people that you know have challenges or make sacrifices it's like something that he he really struggles to comprehend it seems like right right well it it goes back to that that comment you made about the genes it's you know okay these people are lesser than me uh so they really don't don't count um yeah there's a race element to that too i wish i had it in front of me but maggie haberman's book um uh, about your uncle, uh, she talks about, you know, there's one point he was dating a mixed race uh, woman um, in between the various wives. And, uh, and, and he's talking about that as well, like that she got this gene from the white side and this gene from the black side. He's, he's, he's very, he's very wrapped up on all that. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. I w- and then uh, I want to kind of close. Well, I don't want to close because I, I want to talk about William a little bit, but uh, close the loop on Donald. Um by talking about, I guess, is it your last meeting with him when you go back to again ask for additional help on the uh, yes. for the medical fund? Yeah, it was actually a phone, call. If, it was a phone call. if you're talking about the fund, when I said, you know, Donald, it's it's running down, and he comes back with your son doesn't recognize you, let him die and move down to Florida. And again, you know, it's hard to explain that in any rational way, how somebody could say that. Um, I, I wanted to make a joke in my head, like, okay, you want me to move to Florida? Are you trying to sell me uh, a house near Mar-a-Lago or something? But it was, it was just much more devastating than that. I mean, imagine hearing that from, from William's great uncle. Yeah. Uh, it, it's still, you know, when I tell, and obviously I've been telling this story and, and it was an impactful part uh, in the book, but it was real. And again, this is somebody who never met William, uh, who, who doesn't understand that the love that William inspires. And I, I say William is the most courageous and inspirational person I've ever met. Yeah. So he's never met his nephew's son. And, um, and when you call him to ask for a little assistance, given his medical challenges, his response is let him die and move to Florida. Yeah. That's yep. that's how we sum it up. Was that when he was president still, or was that in the post presidency? No, that was post presidency. Yeah, the first story, obviously, in the Oval Office was. Yeah, sure. It was in May of 2020. There's a lot spoke, of stuff going on at that time. Have, have you spoken to him or anybody else in the family since he since he suggested that you let your son die? Uh, I I reached out to Eric and said, I just want to let you know he said this. Uh, I, I saw Donald one time uh, at the Bedminster course, and you know it was cordial. Uh, and, and, and that was it. I have not spoken to Donald since then. So it's been a number of years now. Huh. Um, well, uh, <laughs> do, you have any, do you have any positive stories about him before we get to William? Cause that seems uh, like uh, somebody with a pretty dark heart to me. I'm just, yeah, I'm, we used to, Donald was the first person to teach me how to play golf. We, we have that in common and we've done it throughout the years and there were good BS sessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I saw him in a way that most people don't just relaxed, calm. Uh, those days uh, I think are gone. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd like to play golf. Well, forget about now, but even in the past couple of years, uh, he is, he has ramped up his, his, uh, his ways uh, going, going, deeper into, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, before I lose you, tell us about William. What, uh, how's he doing? What's his life like? No, I thank you for asking because it, it is so important to us. Uh, medically, William is doing, is doing fine right now. Uh, it's the struggle that Lisa and I, I have and millions of people. Let's, let's be clear that the IDD, Intellectual and Developmental Disability Community, is millions and millions of people. Uh, which is why I, I have a, na- a national platform right now, and I'm going to use it. 
Uh, We struggle to put together a meaningful day program for him and and people like William, who is wheelchair bound, uh, needs assistance with pretty much everything he does. So what we're really aiming for is to bring together the three things that we think as a base are, are important, which is better funding for caregivers, better training for, for caregivers. Let's get the housing situation. One, one size does not fit all for the disability community. There, there are different things that we need to wrap our heads around and, and, and get that right. Third is prevention. And uh, I think this will, uh, will make sense to the folks on the right or what the folks on the right used to be. Prevention equals efficiency. Efficiency means lower cost, better services. That's where we need to get to. And as I've been saying, there are a lot of partisan issues right now. Women's right to choose, the environment, guns. Advocacy for the disabled community has to be a bipartisan. I can't imagine why it wouldn't be a bipartisan issue. It's something that needs to be addressed. So many so many lives could be impacted for the positive. For instance, if you don't mind, Tim, oh, William uses a device that is an eye gaze. So he can, and we're not there yet because it takes special training to do this, but he can say if he had the ability to point to a, a card that says, I'm thirsty or I'm hungry, just imagine the world that would open up to him instead of having to depend on people trying to figure out what he's looking for. Right. Just imagine that life opening up a bit. That's what our aim is. Yeah. Um, my old boss, Jeb, was always just such a huge advocate in this in this space because he was like, look, these, uh, you know, everybody needs to have an opportunity to live a life of purpose and meaning, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's it. I mean, this that should be a was, conservative. Uh, his father pushed through the ADA and uh, that's... That still it still needs work, but boy, what a what a step forward that was. Yeah, well, that should be a conservative pro life principle. Unfortunately, yeah, doesn't seem like it's one for your uncle. Um, well, I, I'm glad that William um, is getting the love uh, that maybe your uncle could have used. Uh, but he's uh, get, not only getting him the love, hug. he's giving love. <laughs> <laughs> great, giving love. That's great. Um, we'll give him and the other kids a hug for us. Thank you for coming on the podcast. The book is uh, all in the family. The Trumps and how we got this way. Fred, uh, thanks for uh, telling your story and um, we'll hope to stay in touch. And hopefully I'll get you on my uh, podcast when it's up and running all in the family. More to the story. All right. Uh, You know where to find me. 